time for a little house on the prairie um we're going to do chapters eight and nine these were assigned for friday the video just never got put up so um i'm getting it i'm moving it to monday if you've already done chapters eight and nine on your own that's great um then you don't need to watch this but if not go ahead and do it with us chapters eight and nine are shorter chapters and they talk about the same part um, similar things with the house that they're putting together. It's, it's just more building ideas um, and directions for what Pa was doing. So in chapter eight, um, he is building a door, a start, uh, the stout doors, um, one for the stable and one for the house. And then chapter nine talks about um, the fireplace, a fire on the hearth. How did they build a fireplace back in those days? So they put them together. So we're going to read both. We're looking for the word Tucker, T-U-C-K-E-R. It is not a name, and like Monsignor Tucker, um, it is not a name here. It is a verb, and you may have heard your parents or grandparents use the word tuckered out, um, and that may be something that would give you a clue before we even start to read. Now, in this particular um, activity. You only have one, even though we're reading two chapters. We're going to be talking about um, writing connections. And we're going to think about how we have also made things. So be thinking as we read about something that you have made or something that you know how to do um, that is a skill of yours. Paul had great skills for building and creating things. Your skills might be in um, playing chess. Your skills might be in doing cartwheels or a certain kind of dance step or um, how to do a basketball move. But you're going to write down directions for how to make something or how to do something that you can do on your own at the end of this time and then um, read it to me as our response so I get to hear what you guys know how to do I know you know how to do a lot of stuff but it's always fun to hear things you think of so we're going to go to chapter eight and these are not quite as long um I think together they equal the wolf pack one so we're on two stout doors page 99 Laura felt a soft warmth on her face and opened her eyes into morning sunshine Mary was talking to Ma by the campfire. Make sure we're filming. Okay. Laura ran outdoors, all bare inside her, her nightgown. Mm, glad we're not there to see you guys giggle. There were no wolves to be seen, only their tracks were thick around the house and the stable. Pa came whistling up the creek road. He put his gun on its pegs and led Pet and Patty to the creek to drink as usual. He had followed the wolf tracks so far that he knew they were the he knew they were far away now, following the herd of deer. The Mustangs shied at the wolves' tracks and pricked their ears nervously, and Pet kept her colt close to her side. But they went willingly with Pa, who knew there was nothing to fear. Breakfast was ready. When Pa came back from the creek, they all sat by the fire and ate fried mush and prairie chicken hash. I'm not even sure what that is. Pa said he would make a door that very day. He wanted more than a quilt between them and the wolves next time. I have no more nails, but I'll not keep on waiting till I can make a trip to Independence, he said. A man doesn't need nails to build a house or make a door. After breakfast, he hitched up Pet and Patty and took his axe. He went to get timber for the door. Laura helped wash the dishes and make the beds, but that day Mary minded the baby. Laura helped Pa make the door. Mary watched, but Laura handed him his tools. With the saw, he sawed logs the right length for a door. He sawed shorter lengths for cross pieces. Then with the axe, he split the logs into slabs and smoothed them nicely. He laid the long slabs together on the ground and placed the shorter slabs across them. Then with the auger, he bored holes through the cross pieces into the long slabs. Into every hole, he drove a wooden peg that fitted tightly. Um, oh, I guess. Nope, that doesn't show a picture of an auger. Okay, let me grab my book real fast. Here we go. 
and we'll see if we can find a picture for you guys of an auger. It drills holes. We still use them today. So there's a pioneer one right there. And you would have twisted that through the wood until you had made a hole. Into every hole, he drove a wooden peg that fitted tightly. So no nails. He's got to drill holes and put wood in there, but it will hold. That made the door. It was a good oak door, solid and strong. For the hinges, he cut three long straps, and that would have been out of pieces of leather. One hinge was to be near the top of the door, one near the bottom, and one in the middle. He fastened them first to the door in this way. He laid a little piece of wood on the door and bored a hole through it into the door. Then he doubled one end of a scrap around the little piece of wood and with his knife cut around, cut round holes through the strap. He laid the little piece of wood on the door again with the strap doubled around it and all the holes making one hole. Then Laura gave him a peg and the hammer and he drove the peg into the hole. The peg went through the strap and the little piece of wood and through the strap again and then into the door. That held the strap so that it couldn't get loose. I told you a fellow doesn't need nails, Pa said. When he had fastened the three hinges to the door, which is what they're doing in the picture there, he set the door in the doorway. It fitted. Then he pegged strips of wood to the old slabs on either side of the doorway to keep the door from swinging outward. He set the door in place again and Laura stood against it to hold it there while Pa fastened the hinges to the door frame. Before he, but before he did this, he had made the latch on the door because of course there must be some way to keep a door shut. This was the way he made that latch. First, he hewed a short, thick piece of oak. From one side of this, on, in the middle, he cut a wide, deep notch. He pegged this stick to the inside of the door, up and down and near the edge. He put the notch side against the door so that the notch made a little slot. Then he hewed and whittled a longer, smaller stick. This stick was small enough to slip easily through the slot. He slid one end of it through the slot and he pegged the other end to the door, but he did not peg it tightly. The peg was solid and firm in the door, but the do hole in the stick was larger than the peg. The only thing that held the stick on the door was the slot. This stick was the latch. It turned easily on the peg, and its loose end moved up and down in the slot. And the loose end of it was long enough to go through the slot and across the crack between the door. And you can see that where Laura is, if you look right above her head. And the wall, and to lie against the door when the, when the door was shut. When, um, so in the picture, they're actually inside the house. The latch and all of that is inside the house. When Pa and Laura had hung the door in the doorway, Pa marked the spot on the wall where the end of the latch came. Over that spot, he pegged to the wall a stout piece of oak. This piece of oak was cut out at the top so that the latch would, could drop between it and the wall. Now Laura pushed the door shut, and while she pushed the, she lifted the end of the latch as high as it would go in the slot. Then she let it fall into its place behind the stout piece of oak. That held the latch against the wall, and the up and down strip held the latch in its slot against the door. Nobody could break in without breaking the strong latch in two. But there must be a way to lift the latch from the outside. So Pa made a latch string. He cut it from a long strip of good leather. He tied one end to the latch and between the peg and the slot. Above the latch, he bored a small hole through the door, and he pushed the end of the latch string through the hole. So he just pulled the leather and it pulled up the latch and the door swung open. And if you didn't want anybody to come in, you pulled in the leather. Laura stood outside and when the end of the latch string came through the hole, she took hold of it and pulled. She could pull it hard enough to lift the latch and let herself in. So even a little, little girl could open the door. The door was finished. It was strong and solid, made of thick oak with oak slabs across it, all pegged together with good stout pegs. The latch string was out. If you wanted to come in, you pulled the latch string. 
But if you were inside and wanted to keep anyone out, then you pulled the latch string in through its hole and nobody could get in. There was no doorknob on that door and there was no keyhole and no key, but it was a good door. I call that a good day's work, said Pa, and I had a fine little helper. He hugged the top of Laura's head with his hand. Then he gathered up his tools and put them away, whistling, and he went to take Pet and Patty from their picket lines to water. The sun was setting, so it took a whole day to do just the one door when you have to whittle your own holes and pegs and work with hand tools. The breeze was cooler and supper was cooking on the fire, made the best supper smells that Laura had ever smelled. There was salt pork for supper. It was the last of the salt pork, so the next day Paul went hunting. But the day after that, he and Laura made the barn door. It was exactly like the house door, except that it did not have a latch. Pat and Patty did not understand door latches and would not pull a latch string in at night. So instead of a latch, Pa made a hole through the door and he put a chain through the hole. At night, he would pull an end of the chain through a crack between the logs in the stable wall and he would padlock the two ends of the chain together. Then nobody could get into that stable. Now, we're all snug, Pa said. When neighbors came and began to come into a country, it was best to lock up your horses at night. Because where there are deer, there will be wolves. And where there are horses, there will be horse thieves. That night at supper, Pa said to Ma, Now, Caroline, as soon as we get Edward's house up, I'm going to build you a fireplace. So you can do your cooking in the house out of the wind and the storms. It seems... Like I never did see a place with so much sunshine. But I suppose it's bound to rain sometimes. Yes, Charles Ma said. Good weather never lasts forever on this earth. And that is chapter 9. A fire on the hearth is how they build the fireplace so that they can cook in the house. Um, so he's helped Mr. Edwards get his house built very quickly. And now he's going to start on that, on the fireplace. Outside the house, close to the log wall opposite the door, Pa cut away the grass and scraped the ground smooth. He was getting ready to build the fireplace. Then he and Ma put the wagon box on the wheels again, and Pa hitched up Pet and Patty. The rising sun was shortening all the shadows. Hundreds of meadowlarks were rising from the prairie, singing higher and higher in the air. Their songs came down from the great clear sky like a rain of music. And all over the land where the grasses waved and murmured in under the wind, thousands of little dicky birds clung with their tiny claws to the blossoming weeds and sang their thousands of little songs. Pet and Patty sniffed the wind and whinnied with joy. They arched their necks and pawed at the ground because they were eager to go. Pa was whistling while he climbed to the wagon seat and looked up and took up the reins. Then he looked down at Laura, who was looking up at him, and he stopped whistling and said, Want to come along, Laura, you and Mary? Ma said they could. They climbed up the wheels, clinging to the spokes with their bare toes, and they sat on the high wagon seat beside Pa. Pet and Patty started with a little jump, and the wagon went jolting down the road that Pa's wagon wheels had made. They went down between the bare reddish yellow walls of earth all ridged and wrinkled by forgotten rains then they went on across the rolling land of the creek bottoms masses of trees covered some of the low rounded hills and some of them were grassy open spaces deer were lying in the shadows of the trees and deer were grazing in the sunshine in the green grass they lifted their heads and poked their ears and stood chewing and watching the wagon with their soft large eyes all along the road, the wild larkspur was blossoming pink and blue and white. Birds balanced on yellow plumes of goldenrod and butterflies were fluttering. Starry daisies lighted the shadows under trees. Squirrels chattered on branches overhead. White-tailed rabbits hopping, hopped along the road and snakes wriggled quickly across it when they heard the wagon coming. Deep in the lowest valley, the creeks were running in the shadow of dirt bluffs. When Laura looked up those bluffs, she couldn't see the prairie grass at all. Trees grew up the bluffs where the earth had crumbled and where the bare dirt was so steep that trees couldn't grow on it, bushes held on desperately with their roots. 
half-naked roots were high above Laura's head. Where are the Indian camps? Laura asked Pa. He had seen the Indians' deserted camps here among the bluffs, but he was too busy to show them to her now. He must get the rocks to build the, the fireplace. You girls can play, he said, but don't go out of my sight and don't go into the water. And don't play with snakes. Some of the snakes down here are poison. Yes, southern Kansas and Oklahoma has cottonmouths, and they live in the water, so you have to be very careful. So Laura and Mary played by the creek while Pa dug the rocks he wanted and loaded them into the wagon. They watched long-legged water bugs skate over the glassy still pools. They ran along the, ba the bank to scare the frogs and laughed when the green-coated frogs with their white vests plopped into the water. They listened to the wood pigeons call among the trees and the brown thrush singing. They saw the little minnows swimming all together in the shallow places where the creek ran sparkling. The minnows were thin gray shadows in the rippling water, only now and again one minnow flashed the sunshine from its silvery belly. There was no wind along the creek. The air was still and drowsy warm. It smelled of damp of damp roots and mud, and it was full of the sound of rustling leaves and of water running. In the muddy places where deer's tracks were thick and every hoof print held water, swarms of mosquitoes rose up with a keen, sharp buzzing. Laura and Mary slapped at mosquitoes on their faces and necks and hands and legs and wished they could go wading. They were so hot and the water looked so cool, Laura was sure that it would do no harm just to dip one foot in and when Pa's back was turned, she almost did it. Laura, said Pa, and she snapped that naughty foot back. If you girls want to go waiting, Pa said, you can do it in that shallow place. Don't go in over your ankles. Mary waited only a little while. She said the gravel hurt her feet. And she sat on a log and patiently slapped at mosquitoes. But Laura slapped and kept on waiting. When she stepped, the gravel hurt her feet. When she stood still, the tiny minnows swarmed about her toes and nibbled them with their tiny mouths. It was a funny, squiggly feeling. Laura tried and tried to catch a minnow, but she only got the hem of her dress wet. Then the wagon was loaded. Pa called, come along, girls, and they climbed to the wagon seat again and rode away from the creek. Up through the woods and hills, they rode again to the high prairie where the woods were Always, where the winds were always blowing and the grasses seemed to sing and whisper and laugh. They had had a wonderful time in the creek bottoms, but Laura liked the high pre prairie best. The prairie was so wide and sweet and clean. That afternoon, Ma sat sewing in the shade of the house and baby Carrie played on the quilt beside her while Laura and Mary watched Pa build the fireplace. First, he mixed clay and water to a beautiful thick mud in the Mustang's water bucket. He let Laura stir the mud while he laid a row of rocks around three sides of the space he had cleared by the house wall. Then, with a wooden paddle, he spread the mud over the rocks. In the mud, he laid another row of rocks and plastered them over the top and down the inside with more, more, ugh, more mud. And you can see that there. He made a box on the ground. Three sides of the box were made of rocks and mud, and the other side was the log wall of the house. With rocks and mud and more rocks and more mud, he built the walls as high as Laura's chin. Then on the walls, close against the house, he laid a log. He plastered the log all over with mud. And that's going to be the mantle place inside. If you have a fireplace, you have a wooden board across the top. That's where that comes from. After that, he built up rocks and mud on top of that log. He was making the chimney now, and he made it smaller and smaller. He had to go to the creek for more rocks. Laura and Mary could not go again because Ma said the damp air might give them a fever. I learned about that. Mary sat beside Ma and sewed another block of her nine-patch quilt, but Laura mixed another bucket full of mud. Next day, Pa built the chimney as high as the house wall. Then he stood and looked at it. He ran his fingers through his hair. You look like a wild man, Charles, Ma said. You're standing your hair all on end. It stands on end anyway, Caroline, Pa answered. 
when I was courting you, it never would lie down, no matter how much I slicked it with bare grease. He threw himself down on the grass at her feet. I'm plumb tuckered out lifting rocks up there. You have done so well to build this chimney up so high all by yourself, Ma said. She ran her hand through his hair and it stood up more than ever. Why don't you make it stick and daub the rest of the way, she asked him. Well, it would be easier, he admitted. I'm blamed if I don't believe I will. He jumped up. Ma said, oh, stay here in the shade and rest a while. But he shook his head. No use lazing here while there's work to be done, Caroline. The sooner I get the fireplace done, the sooner you can do your cooking inside out of the wind. He hauled saplings from the woods and he cut and notched them and laid them up like the walls of the house on top of the stone chimney. And you used very green wood, wood that was very, very, very wet. It's one way to make a chimney if you don't have a lot of rocks. Um, it can be bad. Sometimes they catch on fire. But a lot of people used them. As he laid them, he plastered them well with mud and that finished the chimney. Then he went into the house and with his axe and saw, he cut a hole in the wall. He cut away the logs that had made the fourth wall at the bottom of the chimney and there was the fireplace. It was large enough for Laura and Mary and baby Carrie to sit in. Its bottom was the ground that Pa had cleared of grass and its front was the space where Pa had cut away the logs. Across the bottom of that space was the log that Pa had plastered all over with mud. On each side, Pa pegged a thick slab of green oak against the cut ends of the logs. Then, by the upper corners of the fireplace, he pegged chunks of oak to the wall. And on these, he laid an oak slab and pegged it firmly. That was the mantel shelf. As soon as it was done... Ma set in the middle of the mantel shelf the little china woman she had brought from the big woods. The little china woman had come all the way and had not been broken. She stood on the mantel shelf with her little china shoes and her wide china skirts and her tight china bodice. And you can see that in the picture there. And her pink cheeks and her blue eyes and golden hair all made of china. Then Pa and Ma and Mary and Laura stood and admired that fireplace. Only Carrie did not care about it. She pointed at the little china woman and yelled when Mary and Laura told her that no one but Ma could touch it. You'll have to be careful with your fire, Caroline Pa said. We don't want sparks going up the chimney to set the roof on fire. That cloth would burn easily. I'll split out some clapboards as soon as I can and make a roof so you won't have to worry about it. So Ma carefully built a little fire in the new fireplace and she roasted a prairie hen for supper and that evening they ate in the house. They sat at a table. By the western window, Pa had quickly made the table of two slabs of oak. On one end of the slab stuck in a crack of the wall and the other end rested on short upright logs. Pa had smoothed the slabs with the axe and the table was very nice when Ma spread a cloth over it. The chairs were chunks of big logs. The floor was the earth that Ma had swept clean with her willow bow broom. On the floor in the corners, the beds were neat under their patchwork quilts. The rays of the setting sun came through the window and filled the house with golden light. Outside and far, far away to the pink edge of the sky, the wind went blowing and the wild grasses waved. Inside the house was pleasant. The good roast chicken was juicy in Laura's mouth. Her hands and face were washed, her face was, her hair was combed, her napkin was tied around her neck. She sat up straight on the round end of log and used her knife and fork nicely as Ma had taught her. She did not say anything because children must not speak at table until they are spoken to. But she looked at Pa and Ma and Mary and at baby Carrie in Ma's lap and she felt contented. It was nice to be living in a house again. And then if you look, well, it doesn't really show it. Um, if you remember the tour of the house um, from the website that I had, then you know in your mind what it looks like. But in the book, uh, later on in the book, well, 
If you flip through the pages, you'll get to see a good picture of the inside of the house. Um, so you might want to look for that uh, to look at. So in our chapter, the word Tucker comes in the second chapter. And it comes back on page 114 and 115. And Pa has been building the rock part of the fireplace. And he lays down on the ground uh, and says, I'm plumb tuckered out lifting rocks up there. So that gives us our context clue as to what the word tucker means. And I said, if you've ever heard your parents or grandparents say, oh, they're, very, they're all tuckered out, you know that that means that you are tired. So on your vocab sheet under the word Tucker, you can write tired or on the back of it. Okay. Now on your own, you are going to do chapter eight and nine activity in your trifold. And on this one, it is where, um, a place for you to write down how to do something, how to do, how to make, how to cook, how to play a game that you know how to play really well. Write down your directions and then you're going to read those to me. So I will wait to hear from you about those. 